Well, good day, everyone, and welcome once again to another installment in the ComSec webinar series. My name is Brandon from the ComSec team, and I'll be your host for tonight's presentation. Alongside me, we have Marcus Burns, a small cap specialist over at Sperrier Asset Management, who will be taking us through tonight's webinar on navigating small and micro caps post COVID-19. As always, we just have a short disclaimer letting everyone know that Sperrier Asset Management are not part of ComSec or the CBA group, and any examples used today do not represent a recommendation or endorsement and are of a general nature. If you require any personal advice, please do seek this out independently. I'd just like to quickly note that we will be recording tonight's uh, webinar presentation and also uploading it onto the ComSec website in the weeks ahead. Uh, we'll also be giving uh, everyone watching live tonight the opportunity to ask Marcus some questions at the end of the presentation. So if there's something that's covered and you wanna know more, please use the question tool as shown on the screen and we'll try and read out as many as we can at the end. So with all that being said, uh, we'll now pass it over to Marcus. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, thanks for having me on the, on the uh, podcast this afternoon. And um, basically, I'm, I'm going to take people through um, some thoughts on the small and micro cap space, uh, at least how we see the you know the space um, today. And really, the the, um, the presentation is going to go through a couple of things. I'm going to go through some sector impacts from um, the impact of COVID-19 on on obviously performance by by subsector. Um, I'm going to take people through some macro responses that both uh, central banks and governments have, have, have undertaken in order to kind of try to, um, you know, salvage the economy from, from what was going to be a very big depression or recession, shall I say. And then the consequence of all that has been a few distortions that I think we're seeing in the marketplace right now. And I'll just talk about some of those distortions and, and perhaps some of the errors that investors could make if they extrapolate current trends. Um, and then finally, you know, where we see this, you know, the investment cycle with regard to capital raisings. And then I'm just going to finish off with a couple of a couple of examples of, of, of interesting ideas um, that um, that we that may have fallen through the cracks with with investors, just given that they are um, sort of slightly lower growth uh, companies, but but very good investment opportunities we think, and 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 they're definitely in the, um, the SEC, which is the one of the listed funds we we run. So with all that, I'm going to kick off on um, on page eight. So. As many many investors would know, um, COVID had a pretty dramatic impact on on the economy and and a flow on through to many stock markets around the world. Um, this uh, this chart here was just put together really by us to try and give a sort of heads up view as to as to which areas we thought were negatively impacted, which ones were positively impacted. Because unlike the GFC, where pretty much everything was impacted negatively, um, you know, credit spreads blew out, people didn't have access to credit. It was a, it was a tough time for for you know companies to access money, etc. And pretty much every sector in the economy was was downbeaten and downtrodden. Um, with COVID, due to the fact that we've you know we've closed people into you know we've we've, we've quarantined people at home, for example, we shut down retail areas, <clears throat> um, we've we've forbidden travel, tourism, and leisure, etc. It's been a very uneven impact. So areas that were positively impacted were things like consumer staples, where people were hoarding. Obviously, groceries and, and retail stocks did you know grocery retailers did very well. Telcos did well, um, and obviously um, online retail was a natural beneficiary as people were locked up and stayed at home. Neutral areas were things like resources, healthcare, and utilities, where you know, resource operations were remote and kept operating pretty much. I mean, they were affected to some extent, but but nothing like um, most economy. Um, but some areas like those on the right, including things like the property sector, where they gave rental abatements to retailers, were clearly negatively impacted. Um, tourism and leisure has been dramatically impacted. Obviously, you've seen the the bankruptcy we've seen with Virgin Airlines um, and a lot of pressure has been put on tourism and leisure operators around the country. Gaming clearly has been impacted. And then I originally had, I had this, I put this little red arrow here because um, we originally thought that retail, the offline retail world would be negatively impacted by COVID. Um, obviously because people couldn't travel to the shopping malls or only the essential stores were open. Um, but what we found subsequent to that, to the stimulus particularly provided by the government, um, and job keeper, job seeker, um, et cetera, has been that actually online, offline retail has also done pretty, pretty well. And I'll come in to talk about why that is the case a bit later on in the presentation. Um, infrastructure was negatively impacted because people weren't driving. 
um, financials clearly because they, they gave people rental payments, et cetera, education sector, and then finally media because um, it's a very easy cost for people to cut off um, short term. So media stocks were, were negatively impacted. So what's been the uh, that's been the impact, or at least the impact we thought. Um, what's been the what's been the performance by market cap and the response by you know by central banks and by governments. So you can see the um, I've just charted here small, well large caps, small caps, and micro caps, the indices in Australia since the beginning of 2019. And um, you can see in that chart there that actually of all the three areas, micro caps bizarrely has done has done the best. Now it's the most volatile. Uh, as you'd expect, smaller companies, you know, typically um, smaller, more narrow businesses. Um, and so when there's a crisis, they typically get sold off pretty aggressively. And so the light blue line is the micro cap space or the emerging companies index in Australia. Typically, the market caps are under $500 million in that, in that range. So everything, you know, the really small companies, 5, 10, 15, 20 million, up to about half a billion market cap. And then you have the small caps, which are anything from a couple hundred million market cap up to two or three billion. Um, and then the top 100 really is the large caps from 3 billion up to, to you know, 150 billion, whatever the largest company in Australia is currently. So um, that gives you a bit of a breakdown. But, but micro caps really have been um, the beneficiary of, of a pretty easy monetary policy. Um, and I think there's some, there's some interesting observations there, some positive and some negative. A few cautions around um, speculative excess that we think has, has occurred in, in micro caps, uh, but also some opportunity, bizarrely, that, that's opened up um, in, in micro caps and smalls as a result of what's going on from a macroeconomic point of view. So what, what have governments done? What's been the macro response? And, and everyone, a lot of people will have read the papers and seen um, you know, money printing and money st monetary stimulus going on in Europe and the US. And clearly this, the Australian RBA has followed suit in many cases here. But I think one thing that hasn't really been um, highlighted by many commentators has been actually where Australia fits into that relative monetary stimulus. So a lot of people have talked about money printing in the US and is an incredible another trillion dollars, another trillion, trillion euros by the ECB. These are huge numbers. Um, and obviously the economy is very big as well, but, but you know, not much has been said about what we've done in Australia. So I just graphed the, um, the M1 supply, M1, for those of you who are not economists, my hand goes up by the way, I'm, I'm also not, not an economist, but um, M1 is the most, um, is the simplest version of money. If you like, it's, it's literally cash and cash deposits uh, within banks. There's also M2, M3, and M4, and they, those other monetary numbers include credit and, and, and sort of money-like um, substitutes. But M1 is kind of a very basic number for how much cash effectively the, the, the RBA or the central banks printed or produced in the economy. And you can see that the, the M1 in Australia has increased a whopping 38.7%, almost 40% over the last 12 months. Put that in context, that's, that's about 350 billion Australian dollars that have been sort of produced or printed by the central bank. Bearing in mind our entire economy is only $2 trillion. So it's, a, it's, a, it's almost 20% of our economy has been sort of printed, if you like, to kind of deal with the crisis. And the US there is up um, 36%. So it's also pre produced a lot, of, a lot of capital as well. Um, but um, I just want to put where we sit in the context. And also to compare what we've done to many other OECD countries, Australia is actually pretty high up there in terms of what we've done. We've printed a lot of cash. So our view was that this would um, do two things. It would, it would abate any liquidity crisis. So during the GFC, as I flagged earlier, one of the biggest issues was a lot of companies couldn't raise capital. I remember I remember back then, I was in London, I came back to Australia, and um, yeah, GE Capital, GE couldn't raise money. You know, Procter & Gamble, you know, these mega caps in the US uh, that have been around for 100 years, um, literally couldn't roll their short-term debt. That's how that's how tight and how how stressed bank the banks were at the time, and the central banks have really taken the playbook from there and to make and flooded the market with liquidity to make sure that the liquidity and and short-term funding does not become an issue and, and thus grind the economy to a halt. So that's what we've done, and um, and that's the result of the um, of the monetary stimulus. The next chart just shows again putting in context Australia again versus many of the other um, central banks or at least the ones we, we, we all talk about. So China clearly this is a 17 year uh, graph here showing what our monetary base has done versus um, China, EU, Japan and, and, and the US and interestingly we are second to China and that's probably a stat that not many people would actually realise. I mean China has had a very fast growing economy, it's grown yeah, if you believe the statistics something like 7-8% nominally over that period of time, sorry um, real so they call it 10%, 11% nominally. Uh, we've probably grown three to four, say 3% real, probably grown six nominally. But you can see that the money supply has actually vastly exceeded the growth rate of the economies, um, which just has, it does have implications for the value of a dollar. 
i.e. it's inflationary. Um, and also, um, you know, if we've grown an average of 10 and you've seen we've grown almost 40% in the last 12 months, you can see just how much stimulus, stimulus that, that cash production by the RPA and, and central bank in Australia has, um, has, has impacted the money supply in the country. So the, the intended consequences obviously were to provide liquidity and to, um, you know, encourage business to go back to work and people to get out there and, and spend money, or et cetera. The unintended consequences have been several fold and one of the biggest of those has been a massive run in the gold price. Um, gold's back over $2,000 per ounce again um, and um, I'm not here to provide a monetary theory lesson here but if you go back to 1971 when we were on the gold standard it was something like $32 an ounce so it's gone from $32 US dollars an ounce to $2,000 an ounce over that period of time um, and it tends to run up when people are worried about uh, preserving the value of their money or, or are worried about risk. Now ironically Risk is not a major issue right now. You can see by, that by the performance of the stock markets. So I think people are looking to gold as a way of hedging um, against inflation or debasement of money. Um, and the result of that has been on the right-hand side, the, um, you see that the percentage of the small ordinaries index, which is the gold index, is, is now back up to 10%, which is almost, almost as high or actually equal to as high in recent times. So gold has been an incredible beneficiary of this. The other, what I call un unintended consequence, has been um, really the performance of the smaller stocks in the marketplace, and and not just the small ones, but the smaller ones without really, you know, in many cases, much fundamental backing. I'm going to make myself sound, sound like an old timer here, but we we focus on um, cash flows and balance sheets, and we do try to value stocks. We're not value managers, but we do try to provide some kind of valuation um, around what we're, how we're investing, and as do many professional investors. Um, but uh, with, with, you know, with all the stimulus around incredibly low interest rates, um, people have taken to investing in concept stocks and, and stories. This chart here just shows it's a Bloomberg, it's Bloomberg data, and I've just gone back and looked over 20 plus years to see how many stocks with an EV to sales ratio, that means the, the market value of the company plus its net gearing, that's the enterprise value of the company, the enterprise value and the value of the business divided by its sales number um, exceeds 10, 10 times, which is a, a big multiple in traditional terms. We, we don't use earnings here because in, in many cases, a lot of these businesses don't make any money. So I've just gone back to a very crude EV to sales. And you can see now something like 200 companies in the, um, in the ASX exceed 10 times to revenue, 10 times revenue. Um, there's around about 2,200 shares listed. So almost 10% of the companies listed in the market now exceed that, that kind of ratio. So it does give you a sense of, of the, um, the performance, should we say, of companies that typically don't have earnings and so there's been a lot of money flowing into um, speculative note names and you know beneficiaries there have been clearly resource names so a lot of the, um, the gold names some of the resource explore stocks uh, the BNPL buy now pay later space so the zip money zip zip pay and and um, after pay and the coterie of lookalikes that have listed have also gone ballistic on the back of high revenue growth rates um, and so we think there's potentially a speculative bubble appearing in, in some of the names that don't actually have fundamentals to back them up. And why is that dangerous? Well, it's probably not dangerous as long as interest rates stay at zero. But if ever we, we tickle rates up again, then having no cash flow and, and, and being based on purely speculative um, you know, revenue numbers on, and, and growth numbers without anything backing up will be a massive negative and, you, and you'll see a, a dramatic correction there, I, I believe. So I, you know, we would just flag the investors should be wary about buying stocks that don't have any fundamentals backing up. And encourage them to look at um, look at cash flows and balance sheets and, and demand that, that, that at least what they're buying uh, with their own cash has, has some kind of backing fundamentally, not just a, um, a good story. Um, the other major um, thing that this, the, the governments have done has clearly been via monetary stimulus and not just producing money but also by um, pumping money into the economy via job seeker. We've also allowed super withdrawals, as, as many of you know, and then there's been the job seeker, which has been an increase over the standard um, unemployment benefits. Um, and there's been a couple of free kicks to households as well. So if you add all up all that stimulus there, um, I mean, these are huge numbers. There's something like $90 billion of, of, of total monetary stimulus being provided by the government or, or, and or um, super, superannuation withdrawals. To put that into context, uh, this, is, this chart's from Morgan Stanley, by the way. I've, I've stolen, stolen the chart with their permission. Um, it just shows you that over the last over the last six months, that 13 it would be it would be something like 13% of household disposable income. So a huge stimulus. Um, and and the second other thing that's kind of led to a bit of a bit of a distortion has been that not only have we stimulated 
um, you know, by giving people money and, and you know, encouraging them to stay at home and not work, uh, people haven't been allowed to travel. So the tourism and, and leisure space has been a major negative. Uh, and that 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 income, if you like, people haven't had to spend on a space, they've had free to spend on consumer goods, um, which is one of the reasons that retail has done incredibly well. So following on, leading on from that, uh, what, what are some of the mistakes that investors could make? Um, and I think there's a couple of couple of things here we you know we'd highlight. The first has been that government stimulus has led to, in some cases, you know, windfall, windfall gains in the hands, in the hands of some consumers. So, um, if you've got children and you've given them pocket money and they've had to work for it, you know, how quickly they spend it. If they wash the car and do other things, this is, you know, my analogy. They spend it much more conservatively, and it's, it's the same with people. If um, people are, are given money uh, without having to work, and, and there's plenty of cases where people have done job, have got JobKeeper allowance of $750 a week. And they've been part-time, you know, McDonald's employees, you know, previously earning 250 a week. So they've, they've stayed at home and got a massive, massive free kick from the government. Now, that's not a criticism of the government. They've obviously had a huge, um, huge issue to deal with, but it has led to to windfall gains. Equally, some businesses have qualified for JobKeeper uh, because over that month of April, their revenues were down 30%, and others haven't. So those are qualified because they were closed for a period of time, got got the free kick for the next quarter or two. And those who didn't, didn't. So there's a, there's a lot of noise around the, the earnings results we've seen currently where some got the benefit and thus the earnings are better than people think, some didn't and thus the earnings are, are probably worse. Secondly, you've seen some shutdowns, I feel like tourism and leisure, but obviously cinemas, um, you know, eating out, restaurants, cafes, etc., haven't been open or have been shut or partially open or, or have had to reduce capacity. And that's forced people to, to spend money somewhere else. And um, so household goods, homewares, Consumer electronics, um, apparel, et cetera, large discretionary things like cars have, have boomed in June and July. Um, you know, there's been a, a real shift in the economy to so where money has been spent. And then finally, ultra low interest rates is just, you know, has been another big distortion. Um, you know, rates are, are virtually zero in this country and in some countries, particularly Europe, um, Switzerland, Germany, they're actually negative, if you can believe that. So you end up paying banks to keep your money. Um, which is just an extraordinary outcome. So that just means that people have been have been very unwilling to save money and would rather spend it, buy houses, buy hard goods. So it's um it has it has flowed on to an interesting distortion in the economy. What are the flow on effects into what has how does that flow into, into, into equities and what does it mean? Um well I've kind of flagged two potential distortions here. One has been stimulus stimulus distortion. And what what do I mean by that? I'm just I, I guess I mean that basically You've seen some things that have re-rated. Um, so you've seen short-term re-rating of some things, but not structural. So uh, the retailers, for example, I flagged before, have seen some that have had both JobKeeper in terms of lower costs and JobKeeper in terms of monetary stimulus, which have meant consumers have spent more money than they would otherwise have spent in, in, on the shops. They've, been, they've seen incredibly good trading results over the last six months. And I've seen a big re-rating in, in, in the share prices. Um, Equally, the negative factor there would be the property sector, where you've seen both rental abatements, um, you know, has, has a, a major negative impact there. I think I think there has been some some long-term structural shifts away from some some of the property sectors. The shopping malls, for example, are are having to reinvent themselves, um, but does create some some distortions short term. And the other has been in, interest rate distortion. So as we keep reducing interest rates, we cut rates here by 25 basis points uh, about a month ago. Um, obviously, that's that's led to further re-rating of, of, of hyper growth names. Um, and you've seen an, an emergence, what I call an aggressive re-emergence of retail investors, often chasing, you know, very short-term gains. Um, all hot coppers and the, and the other websites out there that have been promoting these stories. Um, yep, there are some interesting stories out there. Australia is moving into technology, and you know, economy and, and our companies are, are in fact evolving over time, which I think is exciting. And you know, we'd be a big fan of, of many of these new industries because they're creating exciting new services and, and tech and, and, and opportunity. But um, you know, we just say, you know, make sure that they're 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 they're, they're based up with something. There is there is something fundamental behind the company. It's not just an idea because invariably the the concept stocks come down to earth pretty aggressively. And then of course um, the gold sector has been pretty hyped up as well. And um, you know, where do we think gold will be in five or ten years? I actually don't think anyone can tell you. The, the problem with gold is the supply and demand of gold doesn't drive the price. It's driven by much greater things. Um, you know, hoard people hoarding gold. Uh, central banks buying gold for, for you know transaction purposes, etc. And so um, it could it could it could well exceed anything based on supply and demand fundamentals. So you know gold's seen as an inflation hedge, and whilst that's the case, it's 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 moving higher. 
I didn't flag that that that, that very low interest rate environment would see um, or well, has seen the growth growth in names you know re-rate. We've seen that obviously in the mid and large cap space and the small cap space with many of those EV to sales ratios over 10, you know, sort of peaking relative to its its history. And then there's some research here that we've we've just put up here from Nautilus Investment Research where they've just put up a couple of charts showing you know questioning whether growth has peaked versus versus value and Look, I'm not making a aggressive call on this. It may not be the case, but um, a lot of charts would, would tend to indicate that um, if you look at um, the Russell growth versus the Russell value index, you know the, that's the ratio of, of growth numbers to value is sort of peaking in the US. If you look at the ratio of technology uh, by market cap to the the, the S and P ratio, the S and P you know, overall index, that again looks fairly peaky, um, etc. There's just a number of things pointing out that, that maybe we're at a peak, and if, if we see interest rates rise, um, that that could see some kind of reversal. Um, and then just lastly, how does it all flow on to sort of market cycles in, in the smaller cap space? Um, I'd say there's a couple of things here. We saw a very a large number of capital raisings in March, March, April, uh, and into May, obviously, as, as boards were highly concerned around, um, around obviously the economy, around the business prospects, around cash flows. And so many boards, you know, encouraged by their bankers, I might also add, um, raised a lot of capital. In many cases, they probably overraised just to just provide themselves for a rainy day. Uh, and actually, it was a great thing to do. Something in the order of when I, when I did the maths recently, seven to eight billion dollars was raised in the smaller company space. And when I did the work, the average return, if you bought all of the capital raisings, was something around 40 to 45 percent. So if you bought all the capital raisings, you would have done spectacularly well. And it sort of makes sense. Like the companies were desperate, they were um, pricing the big discounts. Uh, so if you bought those, and that, you had the, you know, the balance sheet being de-risked, and you had a, a very attractive entry price, so those two things meant that it was an incredibly good time to invest and, and, and take up money if you if you had the courage to do so. The uh, IPO market, which has been shut pretty much in small companies all this year, has just started to show a couple of green shoots. We've seen a few calls coming in, one or two IPOs definitely on the horizon. And I think that as as the um, as the market has recovered materially, we'll see the IPO market come back and forth. Some of those names will be fantastically interesting. Normally, after there's a big break in IPOs, uh, and then the, and then there's a reopening of the market. The first the first ones are the best ones, uh, and towards the end of that cycle, you get uh, you get some less good ones. Uh, and then finally, uh, takeovers and mergers, which have been completely on holiday this year, as as you know, venture capital, private equity, uh, corporates have been have been conservative about their own balance sheets uh, and pull back from any potential activity. I think with the economy is looking like they're reopening with the potential of a vaccine on the horizon, um, with liquidity being abundant, uh, with growth being not so abundant, I think you'll see you know, a pretty aggressive reemergence of, of M&A in the small cap space. And just highlight a couple of those recent ones. There's been Unity Wireless for Opticom, Village Roadshow has clearly received a revised lower bid from BGH, but um, at least they're out there they're buying Infogen received a bid and then Cardinal Resources, which is a gold stock, also got, got bid from um, by foreign corporations. So there's a couple of smaller names with the same activity, but we would expect a lot more of that activity in the next um, next three to six months. And interestingly there, the way you'd like to be positioned in that is, is with companies that make cash flow, not the speculative ones, but the ones that actually have good balance sheets and, and, and make free cash flows. I'm just going to finish off uh, by taking you through a couple of stocks that you know we think are interesting. Um, they're not by any means recommendations from us. Uh, the stocks we have in our portfolio, um, but just to flag that, that while some of these names have been incredibly hyped up um, with very high EBITDA sales ratios based on you know growth rates, great stories, there are some actually some stocks that have kind of lagged behind that, that are still really interesting businesses. The first of those is uh, is a name that uh, many will be familiar with, which is CabCharge. It's now called A to B, and uh, that that's an interesting business because it was uh, it was sort of a monopoly over taxis going back many years, and um, that that business has gradually morphed, um, and um, it, it made a lot of money out of payments. So if you tapped your credit card when you were in a, in a taxi, you got charged 10%, and that has been reduced to 5% in most states um, by local regulation in, in every one of the states around Australia. Uh, at the same time that they were going through that regula regulatory reduction in the um, charge rate on credit cards. You had Uber and the ride-sharing business come, come to the fore in Australia, say two or three years ago. And I think people mistook that, um, that interference for disruption. So the cabs, the cab volumes and the cab uh, number of trips in Australia has been roughly flat over the last couple of years. It was growing a couple of percent. So you could argue that, okay, some growth come out of the marketplace, but it hasn't been killed by Uber. 
Um, what's happened to the earnings has been they've been under pressure by that reduction in the uh, in the credit card charge rate. Having said that, the stock is is very cash generative. It um, has a net cash balance sheet and has no gearing. Uh, they own a, a large property in their head office in Alexandria, which is worth a, you know, a substantial amount of money. So even ignoring the head office of the property, you're probably trading on about three to four times on Lungy, but this year will be a bit tough because they've obviously seen um, with COVID-19, they've seen a reduction in cab volumes and, and, and travel, but that will reopen again as we re you know, reopen all the states and, and travel around the cities. Um, so you're buying a business on three to four times on Lungy, but with great cash flow metrics, good returns, and a, a massive value, value hidden in the, in the property in the head office there. And another one, just showing not sort of just uh, into value kind of stocks, but um, is a stock that we've had for some time in our portfolios. It's called Supply Network. What these guys do is they, they own a brand called Multispares, and they are um, one of the leading bus and truck aftermarket spare parts providers, so a bit like Burson's Auto Parts, but they do this for trucks. And they've uh, rolled out for many, many years organically in Australia and New Zealand, and uh, have got a very strong market share in, in, in aftermarkets for trucks. You can see we've got two graphs here. The one on the left just shows you the return on capital. Uh, it's been very strong for this business. And then on the right, which is something we look at as a, as a firm, we look at free cash flow, how much of that earnings is converting into cash. Um, it's been a bit lower than, than 80, 90%, which we normally look for. It's been around the 60s, but you can see that that's because they've been putting, putting capital to work and, and, and working capital, which uh, based on the chart on the left-hand side has, has come you know, has come with it. You know, they've been deploying the capital very efficiently. So they've grown revenue something like 12% a year on average for the last 10 years and earnings around about 17. So incredibly good growth business. And yet, because it's a small cap, it doesn't have a hyped up name like uh, something finishing in port or, or tech, um, or it's not a gold name. It's been a, little, a bit left behind and it's trading over 11 times, even which is um, pretty attractive compared to what the market, broader market's on. So those are just two examples of, of names that, that have been left behind a bit and um, yeah, we think are kind of appealing. So just to wrap up, um, you know, I think you know, we would say that th there's been a strong rebound in fintech and growth names across the market, smalls, mids, including large cap names, and left some opportunity uh, today in cyclicals um, and, and in some of the small cap names, and also in tourism and leisure, I'd say. That, that those, those areas would remain quite good reopening trades. Central banks around the world, uh, have and we think will continue to give base cash via negative interest rates and, and massive QE, quant quantitative easing. Um, and we think that will debase money. And so it means it's not attractive to leave, leave your money in cash, unfortunately, because it is being eroded over time. And then finally, we'd expect the re you know, reemergence of, of the IPA market in small cap space uh, and MA activity to, to you know, recommence with a bit of a vengeance if, um, if rates stay low and the risk appetite encourages. Um, and then large, lastly, I think that you know, we've talked about the cap recapitalizations. You know, that occurred back in March, April, May. Um, and I suspect there'll be a few of those that, that get done again once we get through the results and, um, and you know, the markets basically, uh, you know, had, had earnings numbers. So recaps are likely to reemerge as well. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll draw the presentation to a conclusion. Lovely markets. Thanks for that. Thanks for taking us through that good information session there. Um, what we might do now is we do, might just start off with the, um, the questions and answer portion of the, of the webinar. So we'll just give everyone a couple of minutes just to finalise their questions before we get it underway. So we've had a couple of questions come through um, over the chat. So thank you very much for asking those. Uh, the first question we've got for you, Marcus, is uh, why small caps and why now? Okay, thanks for that. Um, Look, I think you know, small caps and, uh, and micro caps are, are we, we invest in areas. So we think it's a much more interesting part of the market to be exposed to. Uh, there's vastly more innovation. There's potential for higher growth. There's potential for uh, mispriced securities. Um, fewer people cover them. Um, there's obviously issues on, around liquidity, which can provide you know both good and you know, positive and negative opportunities. And so, um, you know, we, we would just view that as being a much more fertile place to, to make good long-term returns than, than large caps that have very well, well and truly picked over in many cases, um, fully valued in our opinion. Thank you, Marcus. A second question we've got from the audience. Um, what impact on dividends uh, do you see over the next year for your portfolio holdings? That's a very interesting question. D dividends have uh, been dramatically cut uh, back in the first half. Um, many companies declared dividends, and then there was, I would say, something around 80 to 90% deferred or, or postponed the dividends for the first half of this year. 
subsequent to that with the full year numbers coming out and, and having been generally pretty positive to date uh, and with some greater visibility coming through on the economy, I think um, I'd say it's been reversed. 80 to 90% have declared dividends only, maybe a handful have, have postponed. So I suspect dividends will, will come back um, and be a, a, you know, a fairly meaningful part of returns over the next 12, 18 months, you know, three, three, three and a half percent, something like that per annum across our portfolios would be, you know, fully franked, be what I'd expect. Third question we've got here, which caps do you believe will transition out of COVID-19 best? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a good question. And if I knew that with 100% certainty, by the way, I'd be buying them um, and making a fortune. But look, I think, the, 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 some stocks have traded really well through COVID and, and that's kind of what I was trying to get in the presentation there, which, you know, the online retail, for example, traded incredibly well and re-rated some of the tech names, which got sold off, you know, bounced back very quickly and re-rated. So I, I kind of feel like the opportunity for um, real, real performance and real money is not really in those areas because they've already performed incredibly well. Some of the areas that, that, that have lagged behind materially um, because people haven't seen a rebound yet would be... Um, would be things like tourism and leisure, where you know the travel names, um, you know, flight center, corporate travel, um, you know, some of these kind of names have, have really been hit pretty hard. They've raised capital, not corporate travel, but flight center certainly has, um, and Hello World, another small cap, also raised money. So their balance sheets are fine. They can they can sustain a, a fairly long period of downturn and not go bankrupt. Um, and if you believe that we will reopen, which I mean, uh, who knows? But it does seem likely or logical. And travel certainly recommencing in Europe and the US. Um, that eventually will follow suit. So, yeah, those are names I think will um, will eventually trade up and make make investors pretty good money if they're um, a little braver than than most. Next question: um, How much or how much of your how much percentage is a good gain for small caps? Gosh. And how much percentage is the stop loss for small caps? Okay, that's good. Look, it's a, it's a, um, that's a sort of trading question. We, uh, we typically, um, typically look to, look to buy and invest and hold when we invest. But, uh, look, I, I would say if you're beating the market materially and if the market gives you, you know, nine to nine, 10, 11, 12 percent over the medium term, say, give, say the market gives you nine to 10 percent over the long run, which is what it's done in nominal terms. So if you're doubling that or tripling that from an investment in small caps, I, I would say personally that's a pretty good return. Um, over you know uh, over 12 months or so, um, stop losses we we don't tend to deploy that. That's more of a um, hedge fund or a leveraged trade kind of investment strategy. If you're if you're buying money or investing on leverage, then I think it, it might be wise to have those things in place. If you if you don't have leverage, um, you can still make a lot of greater losses. And and we would encourage people not to be leveraged in, into small caps because they're much more volatile. So we would say look take money that's not leveraged invest uh, in names you believe in long term and if you have a, a drawdown for a period of time assuming you haven't, haven't made a mistake with your investment thesis um, then I'd say hold on to it and, uh, and and wait till it recovers properly. Next question. With overpriced stocks and charts looking like the dot-com bubble do you expect a crash soon? If only I can I can tell that with uh, with 100% foresight. Look, I don't expect a crash. We we um, we expect a rotation. I think um, you know I think you just uh, within that within those charts I was showing before they were they were showing um, you know growth versus value, not necessarily the absolute level of the stock market for a start. So I was really trying to highlight that that the growth year names have been um, very well bid up uh, at the expense of the value type names. Um, blending your portfolio would be smart, I think, with a bit of, bit of both of those criteria. Um, why, do I, why do I expect a crash? Well, I think there's just too much money around, and I think interest rates are too low for, for a crash. Um, so I think there might be a rotation which might cause a bit of a correction in some names. Um, but then again, I could be surprised in that, and, and so far, you know, we've avoided any of that. We've just kicked the can down the road with super low interest rates. So, um, but if you buy, you know, fundamentally, if you do work on companies, fundamentally they stack up on valuation point of view. If there's a crash, they'll trade through it, um, and you'll probably make money on the way, other way, other way, you know, on the way through that. So we're not at the moment particularly worried about a crash.
Next question. With many retailers deferring rent payments, are shopping centre stocks expected to perform poorly post-COVID? Well, actually, they've performed pretty poorly already, <laughs> is, the, is the truth. So, um, you know, most of the, uh, of the, of the retail-facing um, property sector has been pretty badly treated by this. And, I mean, there had been, there'd been a force field around those those retail sectors, those retail um, REITs for a long period of time. Um, they've, and they've been extracting very high rents from retails for many, many years. So as you've probably seen from some of the articles around premium investments, who have gone back and, and negotiated hard with their, with their landlords. Uh, a lot have sought rent abatement and, and many have got it. Uh, obviously the government has encouraged that as well. Um, some retailers have gone bankrupt in the country. Some have moved more online. Um, I think that, that that trend is here to stay. And I, I think they'll have to reinvent themselves and add additional services, which they're doing, you know, add healthcare services, add bowling alleys, movie cinemas, all the other stuff. So it's not just shopping per se. Um, I don't think they're dead. I think they will reinvent themselves. Um, you know, people are pretty pretty ingenious when they need to be creative, and I think they'll probably probably trade through it. But at the moment, they've traded poorly already. So um, I think a pretty poor outcomes, probably broadly in the price for some of their shopping centre stocks. And that's the last of our questions at this end. So um, I'll hand back over to you, uh, Brandon. No problem, Amelia. Thanks for that. All right. Well, unfortunately, guys, that's all the time that we have um, for today. Um, I guess it goes without saying, but still, I want to take this opportunity to, to thank you all for your time and joining us tonight. Uh, and also a special thanks to our presenter, Marcus, uh, and the team over at Speria Asset Management for taking us through tonight's webinar on navigating small and micro caps post COVID-19. Uh, until next time, thank you and good night. Thanks, thanks very much, Brandon. Enjoyed it.